Hi everybody, it is currently Sunday, February 11th, and I wanted to come on here and officially open this vlog. There hasn't really been anything going on today. Today is a day where I'm not leaving my house, and I've really just been focusing on being super productive because it is also Super Bowl Sunday, and my husband is having a friend over to watch the game. So I've just been concentrating on getting the house clean, the laundry done. I'm going to be making a nacho bar a little bit later, so I'm going to have like all of the ingredients out so the boys can make their own nachos, and it's gonna be a lot of fun. But I did say when I finished the last vlog, I needed to come on here and provide you an update for When the Stars Go Dark by Paul McLean. This is satisfying a TBR game prompt to read a book that has green on the cover. And I wanted to read this because it has been on my TBR now for at least a couple of years. It was a book of the month selection a while ago, and it's one of the only backlist book of the month titles that I have. And it's one that I've kept on my shelves because I've always been intrigued by the synopsis of it. It sounded like something that I would enjoy, so I wanted to pick it up. So this basically follows our main character, Anna. She is a detective and she's currently going through a very rough time in her personal life. I'm pretty far into the story at this point, and we still don't really know what happened in her personal life, but we do know enough to know that she has lost a child and her marriage is on the rocks. And essentially she is getting out of the Bay Area of California for a little bit and she is going back home to Mendocino. And she's headed there to kind of take some time away, take some time away from her job, her husband, all of that stuff. She's kind of running away at this point. But unfortunately, once she gets to Mendocino, a girl has gone missing and she can't let it go because that's really her whole job. Her whole job is essentially to find missing children. And so she's drawn to this investigation. She wants to help. And since she knows some of the people that are working the investigation because she grew up with them, she kind of inserts herself into the investigation and she's trying to find the missing girl who is 15 years old. And to be honest, y'all, that's really all that I can tell you about it because this overall just feels very vague and generic. Nothing super noteworthy and notable has happened in the book so far. And in terms of the way this book is told, it's told in a very blunt fashion. I can't describe it anything better than that. It's told in very short clipped sentences. There's really no emotion behind the words that I'm getting. There's nothing very descriptive about it. Now, I'm not saying that I want this to be flowery because that's not the case. I do feel like a lot of authors strike a really good balance between blunt and dry writing as well as overly descriptive purple prose, but this author is definitely leaning more towards the dry side. So to be honest, this isn't all that engaging emotionally. I'm not really connected to any of the characters. I'm not even connected to the plot. Essentially, all we've been doing this so far is following them as they're investigating the missing girls, but nothing else. I just feel no emotional attachment to anything that is happening in the story. I was expecting a lot more from this story, especially after keeping it on my shelves for so long. I don't know why I had high expectations from it. It's not like I've actually heard anybody talk about this. It's just something that I've had on my shelves for a long time. So we're going to see how I ultimately feel at the end of it. But right now it's just kind of meh. It's not doing a whole lot for me. But that's the reading update, y'all. I am also physically reading Red Rising. I don't think I've really talked about that much at all on this channel since I started it. But it's actually going by really quickly. I only started it about a week and a half ago and I'm almost done. I was hoping to finish it this weekend, but I don't think that's going to happen. I have about 41 pages left and I will probably finish it tomorrow at work. And I can say that my reading experience experience this time around is definitely more positive than my experience the first time. But I can completely understand why the me of the past didn't love this story because there are still some technical issues that I have with it. This is still nothing like mind-blowing to me and this again is nothing that I'm emotionally connected to at this point but I'm just glad that I'm enjoying this a lot more this time around. All right friends that is the reading update. I will check in with you tomorrow when I finish When the Stars Go Dark to see if my feelings on it have changed, improved, downgraded, what have you. So I'll check in with you then. Hey everybody it is currently two Tuesday, February 12th, and I wanted to take a quick break. I basically spent the majority of this morning doing some schoolwork. I'm in the final couple of weeks of this class and I'm just like buckling down and getting some things done. But I wanted to step away from my computer for a second to give you an update because I did finish When the Stars Go Dark by Paul McLean yesterday. And unfortunately, it did not really meet my expectations. Overall, this definitely was not a unique story that was being told. It was essentially about a detective with a troubled past who is running away from something and she gets caught up in a search for a missing child. But this wasn't even told in a compelling way. There wasn't anything that really made it differentiate itself from any of the other similar stories that I've read. I was very detached from the story the entirety of the time that I was reading it. I didn't connect at all to the storyline. I felt overall the whodunit was kind of fairly predictable. I think I predicted it fairly early on in the story. And you don't even really find out what happened to the main character to make her so haunted until like the very end of the story. And I feel like we would have been able to connect with her a little bit more and been able to understand her a little bit more if we'd had that context to begin with. I'm not entirely sure why the author decided to hold off on telling it until the very end. I'm not sure what purpose that was supposed to serve. At that point, the crime had been solved. Everything was resolved except for why she had run away in the first place, what was happening, and now she's going back. But ultimately, that didn't really affect anything overall as well. So obviously, she's had some trauma in her past, and that affects who she is as a person. But that really wasn't explored in the story at all. So again, there was no real depth or development to the main character. So I didn't emotionally connect with her in any way, shape, or form. I didn't find this to 
be a very engaging story, not from the plot, not from the way that it was written, nothing. It was just very meh. It was like the epitome of mediocre. And this truly is a book that exists and I read it. I was considering DNFing it at the 50% mark, but I made myself go through with it. And I'm not even entirely sure I'm glad that I did because it was just so unremarkable in every single way, shape or form. So that's really the one word that I would use to describe this, unremarkable. And overall, I just did not have the positive reading experience with this that I was originally expecting to have. We're moving on. I decided to go ahead and start The Heiress by Rachel Hawkins. This is satisfying a gameplay prompt to read a second chance author. And this is actually the very last book on my TBR for February. So I'm excited about it. I haven't listened to much of it. I only listened to it while I was getting ready and then on my way to work this morning. But from what I'm able to gather, this follows our main characters, Camden and his wife. And essentially Camden comes from a very wealthy family. His mother is named Ruby McTavish and she passed away, I think it was like 10 years ago at this point. She was kind of infamous because she was kidnapped as a child and found and returned. And then over her life, you know, she had four husbands who died not necessarily under mysterious circumstances, but under unfortunate circumstances. So she definitely has a reputation and Camden doesn't really want anything to do with his family or that wealth or that life. So he has moved far away from North Carolina. He and his wife have been married for several years now. He's never wanted to go back, but he's essentially being called back after his uncle dies. But like I said, I'm very early days. We're just now getting to the point where Camden has made the decision to return to North Carolina to Ashby Estate. I assume some things are going to go down. Probably some secrets are revealed, some lies are uncovered, and I'm here for it. I'm actually enjoying it so far and I'm curious to find out what happens. Anyway, y'all, that's the reading update. I'm going to go ahead and get back to work and I will check in with you later. <music> Happy Thursday. So I am actually currently at home. I decided to take today and tomorrow off because we are currently in one of the slow months in my job. Typically February and September are the slowest months in my job and we are about to enter the busy season. And so before we enter the busy season and I start a new grad class, I thought that I would go ahead and just take a couple of extra days off for mental health and to get things done, including filming. So I'm spending today, tomorrow, and probably Saturday doing a little bit of filming for book two. And I wanted to give you an update because I've actually started and finished The Heiress since I last updated you. And I don't know how much of a synopsis that I gave you of the heiress. So I may be backtracking here just a little bit, but basically this is primarily following our two main characters, Camden and his wife, Jules. And essentially Camden was adopted by a wealthy woman named Ruby. And Ruby is a very notorious figure because she herself, when she was just three years old, was actually kidnapped and she was returned to her family. And since then she's kind of gained a very infamous reputation because she was married four times and each time she was widowed. Each of her husbands died in tragic if not mysterious circumstances. So she definitely has a very infamous reputation. And after she passed away, she left all of her wealth and Ashby House, their mansion in North Carolina, to Camden. But Camden wants absolutely nothing to do with it. After she passed away, Camden left North Carolina 10 years ago and never looked back. He met Jules, they got married, they've settled down, and he really doesn't want anything to do with his very, very toxic family. But one day he receives an email from his cousin saying that they need his help situating things with the estate. And Jules really wants to go. She wants to see North Carolina and and this massive estate. And you know, she grew up in poverty. She knows what it's like to be poor and she doesn't really understand how her husband could turn her back on all of this. So she's really influential in getting Cam to go out to North Carolina and it kind of goes from there. And this story kind of has a few things going on because you are definitely getting Camden and Jules first person perspectives, but you're also getting Ruby's perspective in a way through letters that she wrote prior to her death to somebody that we don't know. We don't know who she is writing to, but she's essentially detailing her past, especially what happens with her four husbands. So you're getting her her perspective in that regard. And you're also getting like newspaper clippings and media posts about Ruby and her family, the McTavishes, because they are very wealthy. They basically own this town called Tavistock in North Carolina. They're very infamous in that part of the world. So you're definitely getting four different ways of telling the story. And you also kind of know that there are definitely some secrets being hidden, especially from Jules. You know that there is something that she's not quite being straightforward with the reader about. And y'all, I'm going to be honest and say that I had a really fun time with this one. I enjoyed my reading experience from start to finish. I thought
thought that it was definitely bingeable. It was kind of like candy, you know, it's just something that you pick up and you keep reading because you're having such a good time with it. Now, like candy, I don't think that this was a very satisfying read in terms of I don't think that it was substantial and fulfilling. I don't think that this is anything that I'm going to remember for the long term, but I definitely think that it was a positive reading experience for me. I think it's one of my favorite Rachel Hawkins to date. I gave it a solid 3.5 stars. I probably would be willing to read more from her in the future. Ultimately, I did find this to be entertaining and engaging from start to finish. So it was just a good time. It was rich people behaving badly. And if you like those types of stories, I really think that you would enjoy The Heiress by Rachel Hawkins for sure. So absolutely give it a try. And then after finishing The Heiress, I immediately picked up The Teacher by Frieda McFadden. This is her newest release. It just came out in February and it was so kindly, kindly sent to me by Jarrett. Jarrett is one of my subscribers and she consistently joins me on my weekly reading sprints. And I actually had the pleasure of meeting her in Louisiana at the Ren Fair. So she has just become a good friend of mine here on this platform. And she sent me my very first ever subscriber gift. I couldn't believe it when I saw it. It just absolutely made my day. And I have really enjoyed Frieda McFadden in the past. I have read two books by her so far. I am very much looking forward to diving more deeply into this one. Now this one so far, I don't know what the trajectory of it is. I can tell you about the characters that we're following, but I don't know where it's supposed to go. You're following Addie. She is a 16 year old junior in high school. And basically something happened last year during her sophomore year that ended up getting a teacher fired. And there's a lot of rumors going on around her. People say that she's troubled. People say that something happened between her and this teacher and that's why this teacher got fired. And so she's just starting back her junior year and she doesn't want to be there because she's basically ostracized. And then you're following Eve. Eve is actually a teacher at this high school. She teaches math and her husband, Nate, teaches English. Now, Nate is one of the most popular teachers in school. Everybody loves him. He's charming. He's handsome. He's good at his job. He's invested in the students. And Addie is actually in both of their classes. Eve is very wary of Addie because she was really good friends with the teacher that got fired because of her. And so she's trying not to let that influence her judgment of Addie. And at this point, you haven't really seen much interaction between her and Addie. You've seen a lot more interaction between Addie and Nate because Nate, like I said, is an English teacher and Addie is a poet. And so Nate kind of takes an interest in Addie because of her poetry talent. Eve, on the other hand, she's not necessarily a popular math teacher. She's very strict. She's kind of rigid. She's also kind of hiding a lot of resentment in her life because everybody thinks she's so lucky to be married to Nate. Like I said, who's this very well-respected teacher. He's charming. He's handsome, but he's also very kind of closed off with their relationship. They only kiss three times a day. They only have sex once a month on the first like Saturday of every single month. I'm sure that there's going to be a lot more focus on Nate and what he's hiding and what's going on with him as there's going to be a focus on Eve and Addie. And Eve is definitely finding her own ways to act out in this story as well. And I'm not sure how all of these things are going to come together. I'm not sure what's going to be revealed. I'm not sure what actually happened with Addie and the teacher and things like that. So there's still a lot that I don't know about what's going on in this story, but I'm here for it. I'm already intrigued. I'm invested. I just love the way that Frieda McFadden writes a story. I find her writing to be very compelling, very engaging. And I've heard that she doesn't have well-developed characters, but at the same time, I feel like I'm getting a lot from each perspective. But anyway, y'all, I actually have a technician coming to my house to look at my car for some recalls. He's going to be here any minute. And I've already been talking for flipping ever in this clip because it's been a minute since I've updated you. So I'm going to go ahead and end the clip and I will check in with you when I have more information on the teacher. Hey guys, so it is actually Friday afternoon. I'm just about to head to the gym, but I finished The Teacher by Frieda McFadden on my way here and I had to come on here and update you because I loved this story, y'all. I cannot explain it, but I just find Frieda McFadden's storytelling so compelling and she always has the best twists at the end of the story. So I believe I kind of gave you the gist of this in my last clip, but basically we're following three main characters, essentially. We're following Addie, who is a 16-year-old junior in high school. We're following Eve Bennett, who is a math teacher at this high school, and then we're following her husband, Nate Bennett, who is the English English teacher at this high school. And Nate is a really well-respected teacher. Everybody loves him, especially the girls. And nobody can understand why he's married to Eve, who is more on the plain side. And she's a very strict math teacher. And Addie has definitely been having a really rough time this year, especially because her interactions with another math teacher at the school kind of got him fired. And now she's got a bad reputation because everybody thinks that she slept with him even when she didn't. So she's trying to keep her head down. She's trying to keep a low profile. She's being bullied by one of the mean girls at school. And then she gets the attention of Nate Bennett, who really loves her poetry. So I'm going to give you a trigger warning now. 
now that there is a teacher-student sexual relationship in this story. It's not considered statutory rape in this story because where the book is set, 16 is an age of consent. So technically she was old enough to consent to this relationship, but we all know how ick it is and we all can kind of see the grooming that he was doing with her, right? But she is completely infatuated with him and because of that, she comes to loathe his wife, especially with the things that he is telling her about his wife. And then the negative experiences she's having in her class, she's not doing well in math. She just kind of wants this lady to go away and it kind of escalates when the wife finds out about the relationship and threatens to expose the relationship. And it goes from there and you're kind of seeing what happens as a result of that. And it was just wild, y'all. It was a good time. I really enjoyed my reading experience of this from start to finish. I was compelled from page one. I really think Frieda McFadden does a great job of towing the line between fluffy and more serious thrillers. You know what I mean? Like her thrillers might contain some darker topics like a student teacher relationship, which was definitely cringe. There were a lot of cringe moments when it came to Nate's interactions with Addie because I just could not even believe being in that situation. So her books might contain things like that, but they're never going to be super dark or gory or super scary or thrilling or anything like that. I would say that they were definitely easier thriller reads and they're definitely compulsively readable, but at the same time, I feel like she does a good job of giving you a decent sense of the characters and I really appreciate that. There is just something really engaging about her storytelling that works for me and I just think that she's a fantastic thriller author and she is certainly now one of my favorites. But anyway, y'all, I should wrap this up because I have to get to the gym and I have to drop off a package here at the post office first, but my next read is likely going to be Not a Sound by Heather Gutenkopf. So that's what I'm going to do. I haven't started it yet, so I obviously can't tell you anything about it. But anyway, y'all, I've got to get going. I will touch base with you when it actually started Not a Sound. <music> o'clock on Sunday evening and I wanted to come on here and update you. I've hardly done any updating at all the past four days. I've barely left my house the past four days. I took Thursday and Friday off just to kind of try to regroup a little bit before the craziness starts next week. Because I was just at home, I was not even really thinking about picking up my phone. You know, there was really nothing vloggable during this time. But I did start and finish Not a Sound by Heather Gutenkopf. I read The Overnight Guest by Heather Gutenkopf about a year or so ago and that was her newest release at the time and I really really enjoyed it and so since then I've picked up three of her books and none of them have lived up to the overnight guest so I'm wondering if that's just because maybe they are a little bit older and maybe she's just growing more as an author I don't know but this one that I just read it wasn't disappointing it was just forgettable this is one of the stories that I had a really good time while I was reading it but the story was not necessarily amazing there was definitely not a really big reveal I think I guessed who it was pretty early on in the story so this is certainly not a mind-blowing book by any stretch of the imagination. It was pretty easy to get through. It's nothing that you had to really think all that hard about. And so ultimately I just ended up giving it a three stars because it didn't do a whole lot for me. And that's kind of disappointing because I, because each time I pick up a Heather Gutenkopf, I'm expecting so much more from it and I'm just not getting it. She does have a new release coming out in 2024. And so I think I'm going to go ahead and give that one a shot. And if that doesn't do it for me, I think I might just give up on her as an author. I don't know. But anyway, just to give you an idea of what Not a Sound is about, this follows our main character, Amelia. And and two years prior to the start of the story, she was involved in a hit and run accident where basically somebody was driving a car that ran into her and after the accident, she lost her hearing. She is now profoundly deaf. After the accident, her life kind of spiraled out of control. She became an alcoholic. She lost her husband and her stepdaughter. She lost her job. Like basically everything kind of fell apart for her after that because she couldn't cope with the idea of not having her hearing anymore and not being able to be a nurse anymore or at least not understanding how she could be a nurse with her hearing loss. So now it's been two years and she's finally getting her life back on track. She is sober. She has a service dog that helps her and she's finally 
finally getting her first job after the accident and things are going well. But one day when she's out paddle boarding, she comes across the body of an old friend of hers, somebody that she used to work with back at the hospital when she was a nurse. And she doesn't know who could have possibly done this, but she's determined to find out. And this is really about her investigating who did this to her friend, even of course, when she's told to like stay out of it and let the cops do their job. And so really what this is throughout the story is basically you're being introduced to a bunch of men who could potentially do it. So there's really not many ways that this could go. And in all honesty, the journey that we took to get there was not even all that unique or intriguing. So I don't know, this one, even though I had a good time while I was reading it and it was a decent reading experience, it, it didn't do a whole heck of a lot for me. So I give it a three stars. We're moving on. I think I'm going to go ahead and give Hello Beautiful by Anna Napolitano one more try. I attempted to read it last year at some point and it wasn't doing it for me. So I stopped reading it and I actually unhauled that book. But Hello Beautiful is the book club selection for the Bookworm Bitches book club that I help moderate on Goodreads. And I try to read as many of those selections as possible. Unless I'm like really adamant about not reading something, I try to read as many of them as possible. And so I'm going to go ahead and give this another try. And if it's still not doing it for me after a couple of chapters, I'm just going to give up on it entirely and move on to the next book selection. Anyway y'all, I'm going to go ahead and jump into the bath and start mentally preparing myself for the week ahead because it's going to be a busy one. So I'll check in when I have more updates. Hey y'all, so it is currently Tuesday morning. I'm about to head into work but I wanted to give you a quick update since I have started Hello Beautiful by Anna Napolitano and I'm quite a way through it. I'm not going to finish it today but I'll finish it tomorrow for sure. I honestly don't have too terribly much to say because really what this is is a literary family drama. So it comes with all of the things Things that you might expect from a family drama. Complex relationships, secrets, lies, all of that good stuff. But essentially it follows our main character William and he kind of was born to a loveless family. He never felt his parents loved him especially after they lost their daughter at such a young age shortly after William was born. So he always felt really disconnected from his family and he found love and acceptance through basketball. And so he played sports all through college and that's where he met his future wife Julia. And this is about him kind of being absorbed into the Padovano family. It's Julia Julia and her three younger sisters as well as their mom and dad. And so this is kind of following them over the years as relationships grow and change. And at this point of the story, we're following as William and Julia are kind of falling apart. They've had a baby, but there is something going on inside William. He suffers from mental illness. He suffers from depression. And that is just not something that Julia accepts or tolerates. Julia is a very driven person. She's a very no-nonsense person. She's one of those people that always has a plan for everything. She also has a solution to every problem. She wants to fix everything. And she's always had this dream of of being married to a successful man, having a family, and she just has a very point A to point B to point C plan. And William has what she determines to be as weaknesses and she just doesn't accept it. And then one day William says, you know, you all are better off without me and he takes off. And we're kind of following the story from there as William is now growing closer to Sylvie who is just about 10 months younger than Julia, but she connects with William in a different way and she understands William in a different way. And you can see that they are growing closer and that she is developing feelings for him that maybe she shouldn't be feeling. And then of course, you're also getting some glimpses into the lives of their twin sisters, Cecilia and Emmeline, I believe. And each of the sisters definitely has their own distinct personality. But I will say that if you listen to this via audiobook, there's only one narrator. So this is not a full cast narration. And I feel like that really hurts the story overall. It's difficult to differentiate their perspectives. But also, I really feel like the way that this narrator speaks, I don't know if it's just because of her narration or because of the way that the story is written, but there is a disconnect from the character. So even now, even though this is a fully character driven story, I'm not really emotionally connected to the character in any way, although I don't think I am. That could change by the end of the story when I'm weeping. Who knows? I love the concept of this story overall. There is just a little bit of something that is detached for me. But yeah, y'all, that's the reading update. I'm really sorry that there's not too terribly much going on in this vlog. I think it might be this way for the next few weeks, especially because we're now entering the busy season of my job. Things are in transition at my job as well. There's a lot going on with like restructuring and things like that. Also, my new grad class is going to be starting. So I'm finishing up one and then I'm starting another one and that's going to be really busy. I'm also partaking in a mental reset challenge at my gym and that's also going to require time and attention plus booktube plus home and family responsibilities so the next few weeks are looking to be very very crazy busy and a lot of it's just not like vloggable stuff you know what I mean so I will do my best to keep you updated as I can and I will do my best to do b-roll as I can but I still hope that you get some enjoyment out of these vlogs and for now y'all I have to go start another busy day so I will check in with you later
Thursday, February 22nd, and we are finally to the end of a long, exhausting week. Again, I apologize for a lack of any type of footage from me. But anyway, I did want to come on here and say that I finished Hella Beautiful by Anne Napolitano, and I have really mixed feelings about this because for all intents and purposes, this is a book that should be right up my alley. It is a very character-driven literary family drama. It is full of flawed characters. It is full of complex and complicated relationships and family dynamics, and I just love those types of stories. But there was just something that really did not work for me about the story because even though it was a very character-driven story, I never felt emotionally attached to the characters. I felt that the way that Anne Napolitano wrote them, she wrote them in a very flat way. And even though we spent 400 pages with these characters, I never really felt like they were truly developed. I never really felt like I truly knew or understood them or even liked them all that much. I mean, there were definitely a couple of really unlikable characters in there that made poor choices and that you just, you didn't really root for overall, you know what I mean? For how long this book was, I really don't feel like that's acceptable. I really feel like by the end of the story, I should have been emotionally invested or devastated by what ended up happening at the end. I just was very frustrated by the lack of emotional depth of these characters and how disconnected and detached I felt from the characters. So I think it's safe to say that Anne Napolitano's writing just doesn't work for me. I think I might have mentioned it in a previous clip, but I DNF'd this book the first time that I tried to read it. And this time I was allowing myself to actually like get through a little bit more and see how I felt. And I was able to get through it and enjoy it more than I originally thought that I was going to. But at the same time, I didn't enjoy this nearly as much as I should have. So unfortunately, this fell flat for me. The characters were flat overall. It was just too long for what it was. It was very slow. It was drawn out. And like I said, there was really no plot. This was all about the characters. And since I didn't really like or care about any of the characters, it made this just a very unmemorable kind of meh read. You know, it is what it is. I read it, but I could have done without reading it. So anyway, I have long finished my TBR. And in order to choose the next read, I went to the TBR challenge that I'm doing on the Bookworm Bitches Book Club that I helped moderate on Goodreads. And one of the prompts was to read the book that's been on your TBR the longest. And that actually is Confess by Colleen Hoover. So I picked that up and it's a very quick read. I don't know if I'm going to finish it today, but I will come very close to finishing it today. And I only started it last night. And this is like very just typical Colleen Hoover. It's one of her older books. So I don't necessarily have the highest of hopes. It was published in 2015, but I guess we're going to see how it goes. But that's really the reading update, y'all. That's all I got for you. So I'm going to go ahead and get back to work because it's a busy time here. I just wanted to take a pause and update you and I will check in with you a little bit later. So it is currently the afternoon on Saturday, February 24th, and I am currently partaking in the virtual reading retreats that is being held by Sarah from Sarah's Nightstand, Lindsay from Lindsay's Little Library, Krista from Books and Jams, and Amanda from On the Middle Shelf. They are called the Booktube Besties, and once a year, I think, or maybe twice a year, they hold this virtual reading retreat. This is the first time I've been able to attend, so I'm really excited, but it is kind of an all-day thing, and so because of that, I really have just been in front of my computer all day, and on top of that, I've been desperately trying to get this vlog edited so that I can get it uploaded tomorrow. And and because of that, I'm not really on here to do many updates. I do know that I owe you an update for Confess by Colleen Hoover, which I have started and finished. And I do need to talk about the book that I have started since finishing Confess. But I really need to go ahead and close out this vlog so that I can get it edited and uploaded. So I'm not really going to say much else here. So I'm going to save those updates for when I open the next vlog. So stay tuned until then, y'all. Although it'll be like two weeks for you before you hear those updates. I'm so sorry. But I'm really afraid that if I don't get this clip up and edited, it will not go up on time because the reading retreat is not going to end for another few hours. So I really just need to go ahead and get it done. All right, everybody take care and I will see you in the next one.